your heart and your mind's attention uh, to a wonderful, wonderful woman, one of our most prolific small group leaders. I think she's produced more small group leaders out of her small group than anyone else in the history of our church. Amen. And it's a great, great, great affirmation of her gifting. So stand with me to your feet, everyone, and let us receive the spokeswoman for the King of Glory, Ms. Jocelyn Harris. Good morning, everybody. You can sit down, please, please sit down. <laughs> um, I'm just so happy to be here this morning. I'm always happy to be here at The Way, obviously. I've been here for like six years. So I just thank God for being here with everybody today. I thank everybody for coming. I just feel so special. This whole week, I was driving to work. Well, my last week of work, um, I was a sociology instructor at Diablo Valley College. And I was um, driving to work and I was just crying. I was just so, but not sad tears. Like I was just so happy to be filled with so much joy. And who knew how much joy you'd have just following like the path that God has for you. I know that sounds kind of cheesy, but it's the truth. I was like, wow, like this is, who knew, you know, all the things that I've chased over the years, who knew that this would be what would bring me the happiness and the freedom that I was looking for. So I thank God. Thank you, God, for that. Um, and I also just want to thank God for Pastor Mike. Can we give Pastor Mike a round of applause, please? <laughs> I'll keep it brief, but I just thank God for Pastor Mike providing a space specifically for women. Um, I know that many women understand that being called to preach or teach um, can be a struggle because of what our society says it means to be a woman and to be a leader. And I thank God for having a leader that I've been, you know, being trained under and being loved by, um, and that it never ever was an issue or even a thought for him to think anything less. Even when I was here, when I was, you know, I think the first time Pastor Mike met me, he said something like, oh, there you are, preacher, something, 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 and I was just like, no, 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 that's not, <laughs> that's not me. But for, you know, six years, I just really appreciate you, Pastor Mike, for um, making a way for all of us. And I love you so much, so thank you, Pastor Mike. All right. So um, I just want to be before you pretty briefly, um, and I just want to talk a little bit about, um, I think the title is, um, what is the title? Can you put the title up for me? I think it's, oh, per, look at God, I didn't even know that. <laughs> Out with the old and in with the new. Um, so I have a little quick story I wanna tell about that. Um, so as you all know, as Pastor Mike just said, I'm getting ready to move to North Carolina um, in tomorrow, literally, less than 24 hours. My mom and my stepdad, can you stand up for me really quick? Sorry, <laughs> gotta put them on the spot. Yes, I thank God for them. Um, they're coming with me the, um, to move me in. I know I'm not a little girl anymore, but I appreciate <laughs> my parents coming and seeing me off. And also just really quick, I wanna thank God for my family that's here. Can you guys stand up, please? I know. <laughs> My grandmother's here. That's her beautiful hand being waved over there. And my brothers, thank God for you. Okay, done with that. Anyways, out with the old, in with the new. Um, so anyways, I was packing up my stuff, um, and that's been such an intense process for me. I've had to go through all of my store, like all my storage, all my stuff from like, a little girl to 30 years old. And like, I did not know that that was gonna be such an intense process. Um, and as I was going through my stuff, I found so many things I didn't wanna let go of. And again, like it was, yeah, it's a really intense story, but to make it short, um, many of you may know some of my story around my food addiction, and I wanna talk about that a little bit. Um, I was, so I have a food addiction, a food problem, and um, 
there was a time where I had lost 123 pounds. And so I had lost all of this weight and it was just this beautiful thing. I couldn't believe what God had done. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, and then I gained all of that weight back. And so back to the storage unit um, of me getting rid of old stuff, I had all of these clothes, bags full of clothes, bags and bags and bags full of clothes that I can't fit. And I was having a really hard time looking at all those clothes and saying, oh, I want, well, I remember when I was wearing this and oh my God, did it ever fit in this? My thigh won't even fit in that anymore. <laughs> so I just was like having a really hard time and struggling with going through these bags of clothes. I had to go through each bag and like look at everything. And Moses was there in the storage unit. One day I broke down crying, I can't do this. And I left, <laughs> or I didn't leave. I just stepped out of the unit for a minute. Um, it was a really, really difficult process for me to do that. Um, but I just heard God saying in that moment, again, not like a thunder lightning kind of, Jocelyn, say this, you know. But <laughs> I just kind of heard God saying like, you know, you have to let that go. What, what are you going to do with these five bags of clothes that you can't fit? What, like, you're going to ship all these clothes to North Carolina for what? You have to let it go. And again, as hard as that was, um, that kind of is where the title is coming from, out with the old and in with the new. So pray with me um, really briefly. God, I thank you so much for today. I thank you for everything that you've done for me. And I thank you, God, for everything that you've done for everybody in this room. God, I thank you for um, the word that you're about to bring forth. I thank you for using me as a vessel, God. That's very humbling. I thank you for that. I love you for that. I appreciate you for that. And God, I just ask that you um, continue to stay in this space here with me and with everybody, God. I love you so much. In your precious name I pray, amen. Okay, so let's go to Colossians chapter 3, verse 1 through 11. I think it, it's on the screen. So you can follow along with me. It's in the New Living Translation. Um, if you want to take out your Bible, if folks still carry around their Bible, I see some Bibles. Yes, I see some seasoned saints in here still bringing their Bibles. OK. Um, <laughs> if not, that's OK. You can use your iPhone or your iPad or whatever you'd like. Um, and we'll just read this together. Um, Since you have been raised to new life with Christ, Set your sights on the realities of heaven, where Christ sits in the place of honor at God's right hand. Think about the things of heaven, not the things of earth. For you died to this life, and your real life is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is your life, is revealed to the whole world, you will share in all his glory. So put to death the sinful, earthly things lurking within you, have nothing to do with sexual immorality, impurity, lust, and evil desires. Don't be greedy, for a greedy person is an idolater, worshiping the things of this world. Because of these sins, the anger of God is coming. You used to do these things when your life was still part of this world, but now it is a time to get rid of anger, rage, malicious behavior, slander, and dirty language. Don't lie to each other. For you have stripped off your old sinful nature and all its wicked deeds. Put on your new nature and be renewed as you learn to know your creator and become like him. In this new life, it doesn't matter if you are a Jew or a Gentile, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbaric, uncivilized, slave or free, Christ is all that matters. And he lives in all of us. Yes. Amen. So just to give a little context about Colossians, Colossians is an epistle. So it's a letter that was written to a particular, to the church of Coloss centuries ago. So Paul was writing this letter in, you know, it, he was in jail at the time when he was writing this letter to, to the church of Coloss. And so it had a specific purpose for that specific time. Um, and he was just basically telling them, he was, you know, appreciating them for, not appreciating them, but he was just saying, um, I'm glad that you guys are following God. This is great. And here, there's been some people who are saying some things that 
are a little off, so let me get you back on track so that you can have a better understanding of who Christ is and what you're doing, why you're following God, what, are it, what is it that you're supposed to be doing as individuals, what, is it supposed to, what are you supposed to be doing as a community of Christians? And so that's sort of what the letter was about. And I think that for today, that there's something that we can learn from this particular um, letter. Um, the first thing I want to present to you is, can you put the first point up for me? Be your authentic self. Um, so when we're thinking about um, letting go of the old and bringing in the new, um, being your authentic self is really important. So um, the scripture that I want to actually talk about first that connects with this is um, chapter, I mean, verses 9 through 10. So could we go back to that really quick? I'm sorry, can I do that? Yes. So don't lie to each other, that the scripture... Number nine, yeah. Don't lie to each other. You have stripped off your old sinful nature and all its wicked deeds. So, uh, and let me read the rest. Put on your new nature and be renewed as you learn to know your creator and become like him. In this new life, it, oh, sorry. Yes, sorry. I'm getting a little nervous all of a sudden. I was fine, and then I got a little jittery. <laughs> okay. So, anyways, when I, when I was thinking about this particular text and again like trying to prepare for a sermon is so intense this is like god what do you want me to say about this i don't know what this means um and that just stood out to me don't lie to one another and in my mind the first thing i said was i don't lie which is a lie right i mean <laughs> everybody lies we all lie we do it every single day um and then i said well what do you mean by lying to one another and then I thought about how we ourselves lie to ourselves every day. We create, we lie to ourselves because of lies that other people have told us about ourselves. That's one way in which we lie to ourselves. We lie to ourselves because we crafted particular ideas of what we think, who we think we are to protect our image and to protect whoever we want to show up and present ourselves to be. Um, and when we're lying to ourselves, we're then in turn showing up in spaces and lying to other people. Again, are you actually you know, saying some sort of lie to them? No, but you showing up in spaces and not being your authentic self is a lie. And if we're all continuing to do that at the same time, we're lying to one another. Right? So when I think about the scripture, lying to one another, I have a kind of a funny story about that, a personal story of that. I was. I'm also a licensed clinician, and so I'm a therapist. I've been a therapist for a while, uh, well, a short while, like maybe four or five years. And um, I myself go to therapy. I've been in therapy for about five years. So um, I remember when I first was starting to go to therapy, this was maybe like a year and a half in, and I was just a hot mess, you guys. I'm just not. I'm just going to be honest. The people who know me out here definitely know what that means for me. Um, read some of the, you know, in the the text that talked about a lot of the moral issues that we need to not be doing. You can insert my name in that place, and that's what I was doing basically, <laughs> and you know, still struggle with a lot of things as we all do, right? Amen. Yes. Okay, I'm not out here by myself. Great. Okay. Um, but anyway, I was showing up in therapy, and I was crying every day. Oh, my God. This isn't me. This isn't me. This isn't who I am. And again, just coming into the session and not having an accurate picture of who I was, like who I thought I was, that was messing with what I was actually doing. And my therapist said something that actually changed my life for the rest of my life. She said, oh, Jocelyn, I have a question for you. And she said, well, if it's not you, then who is it? <laughs> and I said, wow, you know, that just blew my mind. Because <laughs> it's like, Jazz, it is you. You are doing all of these things. It's nobody else. Like, somebody didn't come inside of you, and you're not some other person. This is you. So then with that being said, I had a clearer picture of my authentic self, and I didn't like it. So that's important to know. I did not like what I saw. 
I hated it, actually. And I was embarrassed by it. I cried about it. I was depressed about it. I was like, no, this can't be who I am. It's like, this is where you at, girl. This is, <laughs> this is, this is the truth. And now what do you do with that truth? Um, and I think that brings us to our second point, or my second point, um, which is learn and look at, thank God for the tech team. Hey man, give them a round of applause on top of it. <laughs> um, learn a new way of thinking, right? So how, and how do we do that? And I think the text helps us to see that um, in, the, in verses one through three, if we can put that back on the screen, that'd be great. Since you have been raised to new life with Christ, set your sights on the realities of heaven, where Christ sits in the place of honor at God's right hand. Yes. Think about the things of heaven, not the things of earth. For you died to this life, and your real life is hidden with Christ and God. So again, here I am pondering on this scripture. I'm like, well, God, what do you mean by this? What does it mean to set my mind not on earthly things? Like, well, what, it, what are earthly things then? Like, so I had to, you know, be thinking about that and what does that mean and what are heavenly things? Um, and depending upon our different perspectives, earthly things can mean different things. Um, for me being an American, black, African-American woman, um, my picture and idea of what earth is and again, like being a part of a individualistic, capitalistic society, like oftentimes we think that that is what is heavenly. Like, oh, God, you know, so, some of the prosperity gospel, like God's gonna bless me, God's gonna give me this. Um, and I don't know if that's exactly the direction that God is sending us in. Um, I also thought about a lot of the moral laws that were supposed to fall. So again, I grew up in a Baptist denomination, so a lot of what we were taught, or a lot of at least how I interpreted what we were taught, was that we had to follow all of these rules and make sure that you're, well, you're not sinning, you're not doing this, you're not doing this, you're not doing this, you're not doing that. And like, if you're not doing that, then therefore you then are having your mind on earthly, or on heavenly things. Um, so I just, again, thought about what does this mean? Um, and how do we not copy the behavior of the world that we're in, right? And how do we actually set our mind to what it is that God's wanting us to do? I think Romans chapter 12, verse 2 actually helps us um, with that. Could you put Romans chapter 12, too? Um, and so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way that you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. Um, and just a story to kind of bring that to life. Um, when I think about my call to be a minister, if I were to have my mind to what everybody on this earth were telling me about being a woman minister, I wouldn't be standing up here before you today. And let me tell you, that, that sounds nice, but um, this has been a 10-year process for me. So this isn't just like one day I got up and like God called me to preach and I... <laughs> And I accepted the call, and now I'm going to Duke. Like, that's what's happening tomorrow. But when I was 19 years old, and I heard God tell me that I was called to preach, I laughed. <laughs> that's what I did. I laughed, and I said, this is not God, because I've been told that women don't preach. So I was like, well, that's every, every church I've been in. It's never been affirmed. It's never been some. My whole environment, everywhere that I was, was not affirming of women ministers. So if God is then telling me, again, setting my mind on, if I were to set my mind on heavenly things, but I, that was immediately rejected based on my earthly view and based on what was being told in all these different ways in the world, right? So um, it's, it's tough to stand up and say, okay, this is what God is calling me to do. And despite whatever it is that the society may be saying about that, I'm gonna do what God's calling me to do anyway. 
Um, amen. <laughs> But that's, again, that's really, really difficult to do, um, the process of that. A lot of tears, a lot of running away from God, essentially, years of that. Just like, I don't want anything to do with this calling. But God is, will continually pursue me, pursue me, pursue me, pursue me. I don't want to be like, you know, sometimes I think about myself, well, what is this going to mean after today that I'm a minister? Like, what do I now have to call myself? Like, what is that going to mean? What do, you know, I'm very, my mind is always moving and wondering those things. Um, but that doesn't matter. What, the, I, God can deal with my, you know, ambiguity around it, right? Um, my job is just to continue to change my own mind frame. And again, how do we do this? I th again, the scripture, whoops, that was up there, I think was helpful with that. But we will move on to our third point, third and last point. Thank you guys for sticking in here with me. <laughs> Still feeling a little nervous, that's all right. Um, also, I think the last thing that I wanted to present to help us to be out with the old and in with the new is to understand the complexities of our faith. Um, I think that's really, really, really important. Um, and the scripture that I want to um, talk about with that is the last scripture, verse 11. So if we can put that up, that would be amazing. Yes. In this new life, it doesn't matter if you are a Jew or a Gentile. Circumcised or uncircumcised, barbaric, uncivilized, slave or free, Christ is all that matters and he lives in all of us. Um, that scripture actually made me really upset. Um, and I'm going to tell you why. Um, it reminded me of the hashtag that's been going around, All Lives Matter. And I said, <laughs> okay, Jesus, like, I can't. I don't know what you want me to do with this scripture, but like, I want to throw it out. I don't even want to deal with it. So like for the first couple, you know, week or so, I was like, no, that's, we scratching that out. But it never, like, <laughs> never quite left what God was asking me to do. So I'm like sitting there having to wrestle with this particular text. It's just like, yeah, God, okay. I understand that this is what you've intended life to be like, but this is not what it is, right? When we look around our society, all lives do not matter. Right? Our, the way our society is treating people, we have um, black, um, we have the um, the killing of black people that's happening by our police, right? We have what's happening, what happened to the LGBTQ community, mass shootings. We have things going on with Syrian refugees in that particular crisis. We have how our Muslim brothers and sisters are being treated. Um, and it's, when I think about these things not mattering, and I said, well, God, like, people are dying. People are losing their lives. People are not being treated the way in which you're saying it's supposed to be. And so I was really frustrated for a, long, for, for a while. I didn't know what to do with it. Um, and I think what I would say about it now is I think that Christ has called us as Christians to be redeemers of this, right? That's what I came, I was like, okay, yeah. Christ has called us to be redeemers of this message, right? So let's read the message again. In this new life, it doesn't matter if you're a Jew or a Gentile, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbaric, uncivilized, slave or free, Christ is all that matters and he lives in all of us. But if you don't see Christ and other people, how are you going to be able to actually carry this out, right? As Christians, a lot of times we have a lot of judgments towards other people. A lot of times we're not really showing who Christ really is. And how can we believe that all people actually matter if we don't really believe that within ourselves? I think that's something we need to continue to think about. And what is our role in all of this, right? As Christians, how do we actually become redeemers of this message? How do we be reconcilers of the world and of our society? What part do we play in that as Christian people? A lot of times, you know, we see Pastor Mike protesting and, you know, leading the world, changing the world, all these sort of things. And we feel, well, I can't, you know, I can't really do that. I can't really do that. 
Um, but we have to have a commitment to the justice and righteousness of Christ. That's what Jesus has called us to do. We have to be redeemers of this message. It isn't an option. It isn't a particular ministry. It is what God's called us to do if we are calling ourselves Christian people. Um, yeah, amen. <laughs> So I just, I guess that would be my challenge for you today. Like, where do you find yourself in this? In terms of any of the points that we talked about, right? So out with the old, in with the new. Are you in a space where you are trying to figure out who you authentically are? We could stop there because that <laughs> is a hard process, let me tell you. Both from being a clinician and working with many people around that, trying to get people to see their authentic self, and me as a person who is in therapy, having to be on this continual journey of having to be my authentic self and be okay with who God's called me to be, right? So it's, that's hard. If you find yourself there, I want you to think about that some more. And what does it mean to continue to pursue an un an authentic self, right? And are you in a space where you need to change your thinking a little bit? What does that mean for you? How do you need to set your mind on more heavenly things than earthly things? What are the messages that some people have told you your whole life that are lies, right? What are those messages? We all have those messages, unfortunately. Um, I remember when I was, I've been, I've struggled with my weight my whole life. And in my mind, I believe that it caused me such low self-esteem because I thought that I was not worthy. I thought all these sort of things and God had to work, you know, the, again, it's the continual process because I'm getting ready to cry about it, of course, which is okay. I've been talking about not apologizing about crying and I want you to do that as well. <laughs> but... You know, me believing that lie that I'm not worthy because I'm big, that's ridiculous, right? Any, no matter where we're at, and I, again, this isn't like a, I don't know, I don't know where God is going to take me in that journey, and I pray to God that I can get back on track, and that's, again, as being believer of God, you just have to have your faith and trust sometimes that God is going to work things out that you can't work out. <laughs> So we're going to pray about those sort of things. But I would encourage you to do the same thing, right? What is it that you need to change your thinking around in your life? Um, and again, the, the piece about um, changing or having an understanding that we have a complex faith as Christians. It's not just black and white. It feels comfortable for us to have a black and white message around what we're supposed to do because that allows us to have a lot of control. If we understand exactly what it is that we're supposed to do and we follow these rules and laws, um, that makes it feel as if life is easier. It's a lot harder to have to say, okay, God, what are you really asking me to do and I'm going to be honest with you you may not like the response <laughs> I was not happy that I've been called to preach let me tell you that I'm happy now thank God like thank God for that I'm, I was not happy about it at first but this is who God's called me to be and I can't be anything else I mean I guess I can I can choose to be other things but I won't feel the happiness and freedom, and I wouldn't be doing what it is that God's asking me to do. So um, are you in that space where you need to figure out what are those particular complexities that I'm dealing with within our faith, things that you don't agree? We all have things that we don't agree with in the Bible, and we have conservatives, we have liberals, we have moderates, we have this, we have that. Well, well the Bible says this, and I don't believe that, and the Bible is just kind of like... We have a complex faith, you guys. Like, it's not, <laughs> it's not cut and dry. And I want you to continue to wrestle with that. I encourage you to continue to wrestle with that. And it's okay to not know the answers to it all. Um, God can deal with all of that. God can deal with everything about us. We think, he, we think God can't, but God can. Um, so I love you guys. I thank you for listening to me I'm again feeling real still feeling nervous even though it's over <laughs> but I thank God for you thank you amen